We're back again, and today we're going to be talking a little about the urinary system and want to get uh, a head start here in regards to um, some of the things we want to hit today are um, uh, structures, uh, combining forms, uh, vocabulary terms, and a few abbreviations. So that'll get you in, in, in place where we need to be for uh, in regards to the urinary system. So let's head on and talk about what's going on with the urinary system. First of all, what does the urinary system do? Um, we talked about the GI system. The GI system takes in food, and that food is uh, either absorbed or eliminated in uh, fecal material. But the stuff that's absorbed is used, and when it's used, it basically is going to um, result in certain waste products that have to be uh, eliminated. Once those wastes are created with cell metabolism, things happening in the cells to make energy and stuff like that, we have to get rid of the waste. And the way we get rid of waste is by the urinary system. Okay, uh, Proteins that we use use in a lot of these processes are used by cells and cr creates this large amount of waste uh, and a lot of that waste contains nitrogen. What happens is the nitrogen from the with the waste gets into the bloodstream okay uh, it's called nitro nitrogenous waste obviously and what happens is they pass the bloodstream they actually go through the kidneys the kidneys work as a filter to be able to remove these waste products these nitrogenous waste products from the blood to be able to eliminate them in what we call urine uh, simply because accumulation of the nitrogenous waste will continue up and 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 then can quite be quite be quite harmful um, the process is looks really simple because when we talked about the GI tract, we had, geez, a whole lot of different organs. When we talk about the genital urinary system, the urinary system, basically the organs are few. We have kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra, and that's about it. There's only a few things. But the process that happens to make the waste into a situation or into a product that can be eliminated is exceptionally complex. Okay, we won't get into a lot of that complexity, but it's very complex. What happens is all that fluid, all that or all that blood that gets to the kidney, the first thing it is, it's filtered. So we have a lot of filtration of this blood that occurs in the kidneys. And almost everything that goes through the kidneys is filtered. We have a lot of filtration. We filter probably about a hundred liters of fluid per day. What happens is the body says, you know, and it was a little bit too over aggressive, and it actually takes most of that back. Where we where we filter about 100 liters of urine per day, we actually take back about 98.5, which leaves us about a liter and a half of urine that we're going to eventually eliminate the final product that we're eventually going to eliminate at the at the end of the process. And then what happens? It continues to go through the kidneys. It also then says, well, you know what? I do have a little bit too much of this. I'm going to get rid of it. So they start to purge a little bit more, and that's called secretion. We'll talk a little about that as we get a little bit further. And then what happens is once the urine is formed, it collects in vats with inside the kidney, which are called calyces. And I'll show you some pictures of what these calyces are. The calyces lead to a large area, which is called the renal pelvis. So I'll show you where the renal pelvis is. And then from that point, what happens is the urine comes, urine comes down a long tube that's actually stuck to the back side of the abdominal wall called the ureter. So they're long, long tubes. When people have a kidney stone, one of the problems is the kidney stone sometimes gets caught in that ureter. That's a really common place for it to get caught. Okay. Uh, very rarely in the bladder, almost always in, the, in, the, in this ureter. Finally, what happens is the ureters come down and they empty into an organ that's in the pelvis. It's deep inside the pelvis called the urinary bladder. So now this urine that's been made in the kidneys because of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion comes down the ureters and ends up in the bladder. What the bladder does, it holds it. It's basically a place that, we could, that, the, that the urine can be held for a while and, uh, and uh, as, it's, as it's held for a while, uh, we could actually go ahead uh, when we need to and eliminate it. When we need to eliminate it, when the bladder gets full of urine or when we have time or whatever the case may be, then what will happen is certain muscles or sphincters that are around the outside of the bladder will open up a tube that goes to the outside, and the tube that goes to the outside is called the urethra. Okay, So basically that's what the whole urinary system basically does. Okay, So with that in mind, let me show you a few things here. Let me go up here and show you what we're talking about here. Um, basically, the, 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 the kidneys, or the, the, the urinary system, basically, like I said, it doesn't have much in the way of organs, okay? Just, just only a few things. First of all, we have two kidneys. Here would be a kidney here, here's a kidney here, okay? Kidney on the right, kidney on the left. Interesting enough, a little fun fact, if I look at the kidneys, this is actually a pretty good representation. The right kidney is lower than the left kidney. The kidney, left kidney has a tendency to be higher, and the reason why is that we have an organ that sits right up in here that takes up space, which is called the liver. So the liver actually pushes, pushes the right kidney down. So just a fun fact that you can share with your friends and neighbors and people who, who you want to um, uh, get out of your house really soon. So anyway, you know, 
they'll, 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 they'll be wrong when you start to give them those fun facts, okay? So anyway, we have two kidneys. And the kidneys are basically doing the filtration. They're filtering the blood. They're um, uh, reabsorbing most of the stuff that they've filtered out, okay, which is basically a liquid. It's needed in that blood. Blood goes through there. They take the impurities out as a filtrate, which is a lot. Most of it's reabsorbed. And then finally, as it continues on through these little tubules in the kidneys, which I'll show you more about later on, goes on through the series of these tubules, what will happen is a little bit more material is put back into the urine. I finally have the end product. So once we get through the kidneys, which is this and this, the next thing I have that it has to go through are the ureters. The ureters are these tubes back in here that are on the back side of the abdominal wall. They're very small, thin, thin tubes. They're, they have a muscular wall, and that muscular wall will squeeze. And as a, as a result, it helps. A, a urine will actually come down the ureters because of gravity, because of pressure of the fluid that's in the in the in the in the uh, kidneys, as well as these muscles in the ureter will sort of squeeze to actually force the urine down. So those are the ureters. Then the third thing that we have is the bladder. The bladder sits down here in the pelvis. So the ureters come down, they actually empty into the back side of the bladder. They don't come in the top, but they actually come in the back side. And there's a good reason for it. And I'll explain it when we talk a little bit about the bladder. They go in the back side of the bladder and they're, they're stored. And what the bladder is really sort of an interesting organ because the cells of the, of the bladder are able to stretch a lot. So this bladder can get big and big and big and hold a lot of urine uh, because that, the cells that are called transitional cells are able to swell quite, quite large. So finally, when time is appropriate or when the bladder gets too full, then what happens is then the urine is eliminated out through a urethra, which is to, from, from, from the bladder to the outside. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about the urethra in a little bit. But that's basically the urinary system. Two kidneys, two ureters, ureters, one urinary bladder, and one urethra. Okay, what I find people have usually a problem is remember ureter and keeping ureter straight from urethra. Okay, uh, so you could have to figure some type of a way to figure that out. So clue they could do that. Uh, let's talk a little about the kidneys. The kidneys are basically on the on the on posterior abdominal wall too. They're stuck. In fact, if we look at that abdominal cavity, you'd think by looking at a diagram, these kidneys are just floating up and down and bounce up and down inside the inside the inside the uh, abdomen, and they don't. They're actually stuck behind behind a, a dense tissue and the peritoneum to the back side of the abdomen. They don't move a whole lot. They move a little bit because when the, when people breathe and the diaphragm goes down, the the liver pushes it pushes the kidney down on the right side. A little bit of movement, but not a whole lot. They're what we call retroperitoneal. Now you should be able to figure this word out because both of these we've had before. Retro means backwards or behind, okay? Uh, and peritoneal is that membrane that covers the inside of the abdomen. So they sit behind the peritoneum in the back of the abdomen. They're about the level of the 12th third thoracic vertebrae to about the thir third lumbar vertebrae. So if you take your hands and you feel your back and you feel the bottom of the ribs, the top part of the kidneys are actually a little bit above that lower that lower rib and the bottom parts go below that lower rib because it's sitting on the back side of the abdominal wall. Uh, better, uh, abdominal wall. They're about the size of your fist. Okay, they're, they're not really big organs. They're not the size of the fist. It's something that's really interesting. Another fun fact to share with friends, family, neighbors, and people that you don't like is that about 20% of all my blood flow goes through my kidneys. My kidneys are going to be, and why? It makes sense. I mean, if I have to filter the blood, if I want to keep all these waste products and get rid of them, I'm going to be filtering a lot of blood. So basically about 20% of my cardiac output, which is the blood that goes through my circulation per minute, actually is going through two fist-sized organs when we consider the rest of the size of the body. That's huge. That's tremendous. Okay. Uh, again, they're posterior and subcostal. Posterior on the back. We know posterior. We know subcostal below the ribs. It's surrounded by a bunch of tissue. And I don't think you have to really remember about renal capsule, adipose capsule, renal fascia, stuff like that. But the, but the, but the tissue holds the kidneys relatively uh, uh, firmly against the posterior wall with only a little bit of movement up and down. And that's all. Now, the kidneys, if you remember the lung, remember the lung, what we talked about with the lung, if it was a lung here and a lung here, all the, uh, the, the trachea, the uh, blood vessels and things like that entered into the, into the lung at a little area right there, which we called the hilum. Well, guess what? Here we have our second hilum, okay? In the kidneys, we also have a hilum. And when we look at the kidneys, the kidney shape, guess what? They're sort of kidney bean shaped for some reason, okay? So the kidneys are looking like this. And then right here is the hilum, and, and what happens is the arteries that bring the blood in, which is called the renal artery into the kidney, and the, and, the, and the vein that takes the blood out, which is called the renal vein, as well as the ureter that comes out this way that goes down to the bladder, all enter and leave 
the kidney at this area called the hilum. So it's all going to be right in this area, okay? And that's that's an important part, okay? We'll talk about this. And if I look at this kidney here, basically, let me get rid of my little drawing here. Get that out of the way. Get out of there. there. Oops. I don't know why I did that, okay? Anyway, we can't go back because this thing won't let me go back for some strange reason. I don't know. But the kidneys will show you. And I'll show you another picture before. I'll tell you what. I'll make it even better, okay? Uh, if I look at that kidney, okay, kidneys like, whoops, that's even a bit, that's, sorry about that. Okay, let's get rid of the ureter. Let's cross the ureters out here. So we're talking about kidney. Okay, the kidney is shaped like this. Okay, and on the outside, there's a rim. Let me do it this way. There's a rim of tissue around the outside, okay? And that rim of tissue around the outside is called the renal cortex, C-O-R-T-E-X. You can't read that. I can't barely, C-O-R-T-E-X, and that's the rim. Everything on the inside in here is called the renal medulla, okay? This is the medulla, okay? Now, inside the kidneys, there are these vats, okay? These open areas, and these little areas are called calyces. My picture is not nearly as good as the diagram. These are called calyces. What happens is when all the, 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 the urine is made in all these little tubules, and all these little tubules empty into these calyces. Well, all these calyces come together into an area here, which is called the renal pelvis. And from that renal pelvis, we come out through what's called the ureter, come out this way. So the ureter would be coming out this, out this way. So that's a horrible picture. I apologize for this thing moving forward, but somehow it doesn't. And for some reason in this, I can't go backwards for some strange reason. So anyway, that's my kidney, okay? Uh, you can tell I'm not an artist or maybe maybe an abstract or something like that because that's a pretty bad kidney. But when you look at the PowerPoint, you'll be able to see what it is. So you'll be able to look at that, okay? So let me get rid of all this stuff, get rid of this really awful looking kidney and all this other stuff. It's giving me all kinds of problems today. Let's get rid of all this. The ureters are retroperitoneal as well. They're stuck to the backside of the abdominal wall, just like the kidneys were. Okay, and again, that urine comes down them. Once the urine is made in the kidneys, it goes to the bladder through these these ureters, and basically by gravity will actually bring the fluid down because water has a tendency and fluid has a tendency to run down hill by pressure. In other words, as we make more urine, these calyces in the kidneys become more full. They put more urine into that renal pelvis and therefore there's going to be more urine that's going to come down the tube. So that's what we call hydrostatic pressure as well as by what we call peristalsis. Okay, and peristalsis is a situation where it's that muscle squeezing that will actually help the squeeze, like milking action, to bring the urine on, on down the ureter. Okay, um, the interesting thing I mentioned before that the ureters don't empty into the top. If I look at the bladder, the top of the bladder, the urine, the ureters do not come into the top of the bladder like this. But what they actually do is they come in and they come to the back and they come in from the sides, and they do that. They burrow through the wall of the of the bladder. Okay, so as a result, as the bladder fills, it actually closes off this area because now if that ureter goes through the wall as compared to like popping straight through but coming sort of like tunnels through, as the bladder fills, it stretches and it actually closes off that little valve. So there's a little, little like valve mechanism that's down here and down here right where it enters. I'll show you a picture. As it, again, as the bladder fills, it closes the ureters and the ureters will start to collapse, okay? Um, the problem is sometimes people, particularly like young kids because everything is smaller, what will happen is sometimes the urine, the, the this valve doesn't work or because smaller smaller bladder that tunneling of the ureter through the backside is only a small distance so sometimes urine goes back up and that's and what it does is called reflux so the urine actually goes up up instead of going down the ureter sometimes it'll go back up the ureter which then results in things like infection and stuff like that and infection is what we call pyelonephritis okay and again the ureter linings just have muscle and I don't think you have to worry about it uh, let's get rid of this all this stuff here okay and look at our picture okay I'm almost done doing that if I look at our picture again this is something we saw before we see we see a kidney here a kidney here we see a ureter here a ureter here we see a bladder down in here okay and the urethra go, urethra going to the outside okay now this is just looking at the bladder 
Okay, so like a diagram looking at the bladder, and it shows what we what we were talking about. Uh, if we look at this point, here's a ureter. Here's a here's a ureter. Come on, here's a ureter coming in here. Here's a ureter coming here, and it burrows through the wall. It burrows through the wall. So in other words, it comes to the back and, and it tunnels through the wall. This is where the ureter would enter into empty into the bladder. That's where it is. And so as a result, what it does is it, it creates a valve. Now, there's a little area in the bladder that we'll talk about in our vocabulary work, word, and that's this one here. Let me do it in yellow. This area right here. This area has three sides. One, two, three. And they call that the trigone. Trigone. Yeah, um, colonial guys used to wear those tr three-cornered hats, and they were called trigonal hats because they had three corners. So that's a trigone. And basically what it is, it's at the bottom of the bladder. It's like a funnel to allow things to be able to come down through the urethra to the outside. Okay, Right at this area, right around here, there would be a sphincter. There's another sphincter down here. And the sphincter closes so you're not passing your urine when you're doing anything else. One of the problems is sometimes in females, another good thing for birth control is what happens is when a lot of times females, if they've had multiple births, the, the, all the, the muscles that support the, the pelvis here become weak. And as a result, these sphincters become weak. So that's why sometimes uh, females after multiple births have what's called stress incontinence, where they might laugh, cough, laugh, sneeze, something like that, and they pass a little bit of urine, okay, because that sphincter doesn't work. It's very incompetent at that point. The bladder, the bladder, again, is posterior to the area of the pubic symphysis. Now, we should know where that is. We know that pubis is where the pelvis comes together in the front. We talked about that pubic symphysis is that, that little disc uh, between the right side of the pelvis and the pubis and, right, and the left side of the pelvis and the pubis, which we talked about when we did our longitudinal bisection to make our quadrant system, okay? Um, in the female, uh, the uh, the uterus, okay, actually goes over the top. If the bladder is here inside the pelvis, the uterus actually comes forward, and this part in here that by the tips of my fingers would be the front by the abdominal wall. So the uterus actually arches its way over the top, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about the uh, uh, reproductive system in the female. Again, this muscle is called a detrusor muscle, and this detrusor muscle um, is able to, is is able to stretch, okay, uh, with these very special type of cells, able to stretch and can contract. So when we when you pass the urine underneath neural control, it actually squeeze the bladder, so you're able to go ahead and pass your urine. And again, we talked about the the trigone and the outside of the bladder are on the top is covered by peritoneum, okay pretty obvious. And again, that's what we're seeing here. Here's the ureter here. Here's a ureter. Here's where the ureter comes into the into the bladder. Ureter comes into the bladder. Here's the peritoneum going over the top of the of the bladder. This would be the area of the sphincter. Here's the trigone right there. <clears throat> so everything is all, all, all there and ready to go. Okay. And that's the bladder. The urethra. The urethra is just the outlet tube. Okay. It has a little bit of a muscular wall, muscular coat in there. And basically it's the empty emptying tube from the bladder to the outside. And, the, and at the outside, there's a small hole, which is called the extern, external urethral orifice. Orifice just means an opening or a mouth, okay? An external urethral orifice, or sometimes called the meatus, M-E-A-T-U-S, which will come up as a vocabulary word, okay? Uh, the thing about the urethra in males and females is different. Obviously, in males, the urethra is going to be longer. In females, the urethra is shorter, which actually does result uh, in the process or the problem that females are more likely to have urinary tract infections than males. Why? Because it's a less a shorter distance to go from the outside into the bladder in females than it is from the males, so it's a longer distance. Also, the urethra in males being at the end of the penis is a little bit, I can't say cleaner, but it's in a little bit more um, pristine area where the urethra in females is r right just superior to the area of the, the vaginal opening. And as a result, there's a lot more bacteria and stuff like that that are in that vaginal area that have a chance to go up through the area of the urethra into the bladder in a shorter distance, okay? Also, they think that in males, males are less likely to have urinary tract infections simply because around, in males, and females do not have this, but males have it, it's an organ that goes around the base of the bladder, and I'll show you when we talk about the male reproductive system, it's called the prostate. And the prostate makes these secretions that, acts to see, uh, that adds to the semen for ejaculation. And the prostate uh, might have some things that will actually be um, antibiotic, may actually kill some of the bacteria, or not really antibiotic, but actually prevent the bacteria from causing infection inside the bladder. Okay, so females have a lot more bladder, bladder infections than males. Males rarely do. Kids do because everything is smaller. What happens, I have three words down here, micturition, voiding, and urination, and they all mean the same thing. That means passing urine. Okay, very simple. 
Uh, again, that urethra we talked about, female is shorter, separate from the, it's, the female urethra is separate from the reproductive tract, where in the male that we'll talk about, the urethra is part of the reproductive tract because that's the area where, where spermatozoa and semen are going to come out through. We talked about in male that urethra goes through that prostate gland, okay, and uh, that's the important thing that we have to talk about. I don't think we need to mention anything else on this. And again, this is just the male. So if we looked at the male here, uh, in regards to what we have, this area right here is the bladder. Here's the prostate. This is the prostate that would be, oh, it would make a different color. There's the prostate right here. And the urethra is coming down this way and then down, out, and through the end of the penis. So that's what we see with the urethra. So it's much longer and stuff like that. We'll talk more about all these other structures. And again, that prostate is not in females, only in males. Okay. Now let's get to some combining forms and get some co combining forms out of the way. The first combining form I have is calio or calico. We talked about how when the urine is made in the kidneys, um, it's going through a series of tubules. Okay, and these tubules have different functions. And I'll talk about that not probably not today, but later on. Okay, in another video. And what happens is when the urine is finally made in the kidneys, it collects in these vats inside the kidneys, and those cat vats are called calices. We have some that are small; they're called minor calices. We have some that are bigger that are called major calices. So calio or calico mean calyx, which are these open areas inside the kidneys where the urine will collect. Okay, cysto. Cysto is just another word root that means bladder. If you see cysto, it means bladder. Um, so when people have a bladder infection, it's called a cystitis. Cystitis. Glomerulo. Glomerulo right now, I just want you to think about this, is when the kidney is, or when the blood comes to the kidney and it gets filtered, what happens is we, we know from our cardiovascular system that things go from arteries to arterioles to capillaries. What happens is in the kidneys we have the same thing. We have a little bit of difference later on, which I'll talk about some of the difference in, in regards to the circula circulation of the kidneys. We go from arteries, like the renal artery that comes from the aorta, which we all know the aorta, to the kidney. And what happens is it gets inside the kidney, it branches off. When it branches off, the arteries get smaller and smaller, they become arterioles, which have muscular walls, so they can open and close to either bring more or less blood to a certain area. What happens at the end of this arteriole, which is actually going into the kidney, it's called the afferent arteriole. Afferent, we talked about as a word, means something that goes into something, okay? So this afferent arteriole goes into this the, a certain area of the kidney where it becomes a ball of capillaries. Instead of having just a single capillary, we have a big ball of capillaries. And this ball of capillaries inside the kidney where all the filtration occurs, the ball of capillaries inside the kidney, and there's millions of these, okay? The ball of capillaries inside the kidneys is called the glomerulus. So glomerulo means this ball of capillaries. Now this ball of capillaries, which comes in, so I have my, I have an afferent arterial coming in, and this ball of capillaries that are in there, okay? And what happens is that ball of capillaries is surrounded by a, a cup that comes around this way. And this cup is called Bowman's, B-O-W-M-A, it won't show up, Bowman's, B-O-W-M-A-N apostrophe S capsule. So everything that's filtered, all that fluid gets filtered, gets into the area, let me put it this way, gets into the area of gets collected in this Bowman's capsule and starts to go down, and this down here would be called the renal tubules, down here, and it goes through a long convoluted thing. But this area in here, where all that ball of capillaries is, is called the glomerulus, okay, called the glomerulus. We'll come back to that, and I'll show you a lot more about that in probably a whole different uh, video, because we'll, otherwise we'll blow your mind, you're going to turn it off right now, you're going to go to bed or go get something to eat, and then I'll be, you know, then it'll be my fault that you gain five pounds. So we don't want that to happen. Miedo. Miedo means opening. What happens is when the urethra comes to the outside, it goes to a small little opening called a meatus. So miedo means opening or, or mouth of something. Nephro. Nephro we've had before uh, in, in, at the very beginning of the semester. Nephro means kidney, means kidney. Okay, so if you see nephritis, inflammation of the kidney, nephrectomy, removal of the kidney, you know. Um, uh, so nephro means kidney. Paello. Paello means renal pelvis. Again, we talked about how that kidney, you know, is like this, and then that, that ureter comes out this way. What happens is this area right here where all these calyces are feeding into, into this area, this area right here 
where the ureter starts and where all these calyces feed into is called the renus, renal pelvis. And paello is a word that means renal, a word root that means renal pelvis. Reno obviously means kidney, no problem. Trigono, we talked about that. We talked about how that bladder has that triangular area, like a funnel that's going down to the urethra. So trigono means trigone, okay? Ureto, ure, uh, ureto means you know, ureter, okay? Which is then that tube that comes down from the kidneys down to the bladder. Urethro means the area of the tube that goes from the bladder to the outside. And vesico, vesico also means, whoops, vesico also means bladder, just like cysto. Cysto and vesico both are, are word roots that mean, um, that mean bladder, okay? So basically that's where we are with some of these combining forms, word, word roots and structures. Couple substances that we need to talk about, albumino. Albumin's a protein, okay? And albumin is a protein, I think we mentioned, may have mentioned in the GI, is made in the liver. Liver is the only place that makes this albumin. And what happens is the kidneys, albumin is, is, a, is a pretty big size molecule. When the blood gets down in that ball of capillaries, that glomerulus, the, the albumin is just too darn big to get out of the capillaries to get in that capsule, that Bowman's capsule to go down the tubules. So basically we should have no, no albumin, no protein in the urine. If we start to show, if a person on an examination starts to show um, uh, protein in the urine, it usually means something's wrong, okay? You shouldn't see any protein in the urine, and uh, the protein that we usually see is albumin. So albumino means albumin, which is a protein. Azoto, azoto means nitrogen means nitrogen, okay? Um, if the kidneys aren't working, we talked about in the very first couple minutes of this, that what happens, I gotta get rid of these nitrogenous wastes. If the, if the nitrogen can't be get rid of, get, gotten rid of because the kidneys aren't working, the amount of nitrogen continues to build up in the blood, and that's called azotemia. Emia, blood, azoto, protein means, or excuse me, nitrogen, nitrogen in the blood, and that could be a, a big problem. Bacterio obviously means bacteria. It shouldn't take a rocket scientist to, to figure that one out. Dipso. Dipso is a word root combining form that means thirst, that means thirst, okay? Uh, somebody, like, in, in, in people with, uh, with diabetes, they have polydipsia, which means poly, many, dipso, thirst. They're thirsty all the time. They're always drinking something. Okay, and the reason why is because their their actually their their blood has such a higher concentration of of uh, glucose. Uh, it's not making like syrup or like anything like that, but it's it's going to want to draw water in in there to try to balance that out. So that's why they have a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, urine. They also have what's called polyuria, polyuria, which means they have lots of urine as well because they're drinking a lot. Keto or ketono means ketones. Now say what in the world's a ketone? I don't know what a ketone is. Well, what happens is ketones are breakdown products of fats and fatty acids. When a when glucose is broken down, it's broken down to carbon dioxide and water and very simple things. When protein is broken down, it's broken down into like urea and a bunch of other stuff. But when fats are broken down, they're broken down to ketones. These ketones are acidic. They're acids. So what happens is, let me give you a perfect example. I have a diabetic patient. Okay, and this diabetic patient, their blood sugar goes up. I have to get to get the blood sugar or to get the glucose and the sugar into the cell, I need a hormone called insulin. So let's say they don't have the insulin and their blood sugar goes up. Well, the cells still need to make energy. So instead of using glucose for energy, they say, well, what else do we have in the freezer? And they look in the freezer and they pull out and say, hey, we got some fats in the freezer. So these fats start to be used for energy, okay? So the fats are, are used for energy. The problem is when the fats are burned for energy, the byproducts or the waste products of fat uh, used for energy are ketones. And these ketones are acidic. They start to build up in the blood. As they build up in the blood, they make the pH of the blood become more acidic, which means the pH goes down, and that could be a real significant problem. If you know some of diabetes, sometimes they get what's called keto, a diabetic ketoacidosis. So what happens, which can actually in some cases be fatal. So ketones are basically the byproducts of, 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 of fats. Um, interesting thing. Somebody goes to Jenny Craig, you know, to get uh, uh, to, to lose weight, and they go and you, know, you go in one week and oh, you good, good, sweetie, you've lost uh, uh, you know uh, two pounds. Great, keep up the good work. And they go back the next week. Oh, great, you lost two pounds again. Keep it up, you know, and stuff like that. They go back. They go back the third week and says, what's happened? You didn't lose your weight. Actually, you gained a couple pounds. And the person says, oh no, I've been doing my diet. I've been doing my diet. 
what happens is when people use a diet and they decrease their carbohydrate intake they also start to burn more fats to get rid of some of the fat deposits in the body they burn more fats so as a result if they're if they're dieting and they're starving themselves a little bit or they're decreasing their caloric intake by the way of decreasing their amount of, of, of carbohydrates they're using more fats what's the byproduct of fats? fats ketone so they say okay why don't you just give me a little urine they go in the, the back they take the urine they put a little dipstick in there and they come out and say guess what you're lying to me you haven't been fasting why because if they were fasting there would be ketones in the urine because they're now using more fats and that little amount of fats is okay it's not gonna hurt them but they're using more fats to make uh, to, to, for energy production and they if they are the byproducts would be ketones and there'd be increased ketones in the urine but so that's just another little fun, fun fact okay uh, litho litho and we know mean stones we talked about with the with the gallbladder cholelithiasis and stuff like that in a previous GI thing so litho means stone um, uh, nephrolithiasis would mean a kidney stone piece of cake nocto <clears throat> nocto sounds like nocturnal there's a good reason why nocto means night things are nocturnal night so nocto so somebody has who has nocturia means that they get up multiple times in the middle of the night to pass the urine Okay, urea means urine, nocto, night urine, nocto, nocturia. Okay, oligo means scanty or little or few. So sometimes what will happen is the kidneys, if we if we if we're dehydrated uh, and we want to save the fluid, so we don't urinate as much. You know, if you've been sweating your urine is going to change instead of being very watery looking it becomes darker it becomes more yellow and smaller amounts why because the body's trying to save the water because we've lost a lot through perspiration and stuff like that and what happens is when we have that scanty or lesser amounts of urine that's called oliguria oliguria scanty amounts of urine pio pio means pus means pus so pyuria would be pus in the urine Okay, uro means urine and urino both mean urine. Makes no makes you know makes logical sense. So some of those, uh, a couple art, uh, vocabulary words that we should talk about. Arteriole, arteriole are, are basically those small arteries. Now we talked about how in uh, normal situations, okay, uh, we go from an artery to an arteriole, I O L E, okay, um, to a capillary to a venule to a vein. Well, guess what? In the kidneys, it doesn't do that way. It's actually a little bit different. Okay. What happens is we have an we have what's called an afferent arteriole that comes in and that goes to that ball of capillaries, which is called the glomerulus. Well, now normally I should have a venue coming out, but I don't. Out from that ball of capillaries, I have an efferent arteriole. Efferent arteriole. Here's my afferent arteriole. Okay. And then from the efferent arteriole, which is leaving the ball of capillaries. I have these. I have all these tubules where the urine is being made. Then those tubules are surrounded by all these capillaries that go around the tubes. They're called peritubular capillaries. And then from those peritubular capillaries, it goes to a venule, to a vein, and back into the vena cava, which takes the blood back to the heart. Okay. So the arteriole basically is a smaller vessel. And what's the difference between arteriole and artery? Arterioles have a muscular wall, so they can open or close. So it actually allows and changes the blood flow to the kidneys by either the arteriole opening or closing, and will change the pressure in the area of the uh, of the glomerulus uh, by the fact is if if I if I shrink down this one, the pressure inside the glomerular capillaries increases, and I have more filtration. If I open this one up wider, there's not as much pressure here, and the and the blood is going to go from the glomerular capillaries out, and I won't have as much filtration. Okay, so these capillaries uh, are these should be the arterioles help to control the amount of urine output that we have by either getting bigger or smaller. It's a long, complicated thing, and I may make another video just to talk about that. Calyx we talked about is those little areas that collect the urine. Okay, catheter. Catheter is basically a tube. If someone has difficult time passing their urine, they take the catheter, pass it up through the urethra into the bladder, and they can drain it. If we were back in class, I have a, a bunch of catheters in the back of the class that we could swing around, but I I'm don't I don't have any at home. Okay, cortex. I talked about the out. Uh, the, the, uh, early on, I drew a picture of the kidney. That outer rim of the kidney is called the renal cortex. It's a very very thin rim on the outside. Creatinine. Creatinine is basically a uh, is a, 
a, a breakdown product as well of, prote of protein. Okay, so when proteins break it bro broken down, one of the uh, proteins that's break broken down is broken down to is called creatinine. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Electrolytes. Electrolytes in the body have to be kept stable, okay, for homeostasis to occur. Electrolytes are things like sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, you know, magnesium, calcium, and stuff like that. Who controls that? Who controls how much of the, how, that that electrolyte balance? Of course the kidneys. The kidneys will do that. So that's an important thing about electrolytes. Erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is really interesting because everybody says, well, if I said, what does it, what do the kidneys do? You say, well, it makes urine. That's true. But here's what else the kidneys do. They also stimulate the production of red blood cells. When my red blood cell count goes down, the kidneys detect it. And what they do is they put out this hormone called EPO or erythropoietin. And the EPO or erythropoietin then feeds back to the bone marrow that says, hey, uh, stem cells in the bone marrow make more red blood cells, and they do. So erythropoietin is, 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 a, is a hormone that's made from the kidney, or made in the kidney, that tells the bone marrow to make more red blood cells when we need more red blood cells made, like an anemia. Anemia, they're probably putting out more erythropoietin to try to increase the number of red blood cells. Filtration. Filtration is what occurs at that area of the glomerulus. Okay, that's where we take a lot of that blood and we filter it. We get most of those, you know, a lot of that fluid out. Okay, and that's what we call filtration. And where does it occur? It occurs in the area of the glomerulus. Okay, so those are some vocabulary words there. Hilum we talked about. Hilum is that little uh, indented place in the kidney where the renal artery goes in, the renal vein comes out, as well as the ureter comes out. Everything enters or leaves the kidney at the hilum. Do I have to tell you what a kidney is? I don't think so. Meatus we talked about is the opening to the outside from the urethra to the outside and opening. On the outside of the kidney was the, was the cortex. Inside that is called the medulla. So inside the inner portion of the kidney is called the medulla. And that's where most of the magic happens. There's where most of the urine is made. And also within that medulla is where I also have all those calyces uh, where, which are collecting the, 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 final, the final formation of urine. Okay, And that's in the, in, the, in the renal medulla. It's the majority. It's the larger bulk of the kidney. Okay, Micturition is just a word that means urination. We had that one before. Now, what happens is the kidney is involved with a bunch of tubules. Okay, it starts out with that Bowman's capsule. Let me get get something up. Let me do it with my finger here. I have my let me do it a different color. I have my Bowman's capsule here. Okay, and what happens is that Bowman's capsule leads to a long tubule, and what happens goes to a, a, a winding uh, group of tubules from that point, and those are called the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal because it means close to where the, the where the where the glomerulus is. Convoluted because it's in different twists and turns and then it's called tubule because it's a tubule okay what happens is I go through this proximal convoluted tubule and there's another thing that comes down to a big loop that comes way down in, in the in the renal medulla okay and it starts to come back up and this is called the loop of Henley so if you see the loop of Henley that's what it is and uh, this does a lot of concentration of urine in that loop of Henley once the the tubule, which is the part of the loop of Henley, so there's one long tubule, by the way. So once it goes through the loop of Henley, it goes through another area of, of twisting tubules, which is called the distal convoluted tubule. And then it goes into what's called, comes out, it goes into a collecting duct. And the collecting duct takes us down to the calyx. calyx. This whole area with all these tubules here is called the nephron. The nephron is where the urine is made. The nephron is where the urine is made. The nephron is where the urine is made. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney that makes the urine. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney that makes the urine. Nitrogenous waste, waste that's our nitrogen because proteins are largely nitrogen, have a lot of nitrogen in them. So when proteins are broken down, one of the byproducts of that is always going to be nitrogenous waste. Potassium, we know is an electrolyte okay and uh, basically it's important for a lot of different things and we could talk a lot about it but potassium is basically an electrolyte reabsorption what happens you gotta remember that when the when the when the blood gets into the kidney the first thing that happens is filtration you filter a lot from filtration I go to reabsorption where I take most of it back and then finally after that just before it becomes final and the top shelf urine it goes into secretion and so reabsorption is that second process of making urine where most of the stuff that's been filtered is actually reabsorbed.
Okay, renal artery is the artery. It's right from the aorta that goes into the into the uh, a kidney. Uh, renal pelvis is again that area where where just where the where the ureter starts, where all those calyces come together, and all the urine is forming or is is deposited in the kidney at the renal pelvis before it starts to come down the ureter. Renal tubules again the same thing as the ne the nephron is all these series of tubules, the glomerulus or, or the or Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, collecting duct. All those are all in the same. So that's the uh, Bowman's capsule, Bowman, can't read this, okay, to the proximal convoluted tubule, to the loop of Henle, to the distal convoluted tubule, to the collecting duct, and out to the area of the calyx. Okay, so basically the tubules are those things. Renal vein basically takes blood back to the, the inferior vena cava after it's been used and filtered to go back to the to the to the body. Renin. Renin is really interesting. Is really interesting. It's a hor another hormone that the kidneys make. Now people say, okay, now oh great, now we know that, that the kidneys make make a urine, and we know that the kidneys are helpful in forming red blood cells. Good. What else can the kidney do? Well, guess what? We haven't stopped there. It controls blood pressure. Uh, kidneys are exceptionally important in controlling blood pressure. When the blood pressure to the glomerulus or a filtration goes real low, it sets off a series of reactions. Okay? And what happens, we start with a hormone that's made by the kidney called renin. When I have renin, and you don't have to remember this because it's a little bit more convoluted, but I think it's interesting. The renin actually sort of forces something called angiotensinogen to become what's called angiotensin 1, which is another hormone type material. The angiotensin 1 goes to the lungs, and enzymes in the lungs convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a, is a, is a, is a material, a chemical, that will raise the blood pressure. So renin, when the, when the blood flow to the kidney is low, the kidneys secrete renin, and the renin starts to go from the angiotensinogen to the angiotensin 1, angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, angiotensin 2 raises the blood pressure. Also, the angiotensin 2 then goes to the adrenal, you're probably getting whacked out right now, it goes to the adrenal, and in the adrenal, what happens, it causes secretion of something called aldosterone, which, which, which uh, conserves water. It pulls water out of the urine, so we save more water, which then puts more water or fluid into the vascular system, which raises the blood pressure too. It's a really interesting way that is. Sodium, we know, is another electrolyte, which is really important. Trigone, we've already talked about. Urea. Urea is a byproduct of... Uh, of uh, 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 nitrogen waste, okay, and it's something that we with, that we get rid of. They don't call it urine for nothing, okay. And part of the, what we have in the urine is urea, which is basically very uh, this nitro nitrogen compound that I could eliminate. Ureter, we know, is basically the tube that that eliminates, uh, you know, or the the ureter goes from the from the from the kidney down to the bladder. Urethra from the bladder to the outside. Uric acid. Uric acid is interesting because what happens is uric acid is also a byproduct of protein breakdown. There are a couple different types of proteins. One's called a pyrimidine and the other one's called a purine. Okay, you don't have to remember this, but I think it's sort of cool. I think everything's cool, by the way. But anyway, these purines, when they're broken down, one of the byproducts that we have is uric acid. Now we get rid of the uric acid. Okay, we, we, we eliminate that with the urea and other materials and other nitrogenous waste in my urine. However, in some situations, that uric acid will build up okay and in some situations that uric acid will deposit in in joints and when the uric acid deposits in joints it causes an inflammation it's like a crystal it's like a little spear and what happens it gets inside the joints okay and what happens is white blood cells say hey you ain't supposed to be there i'm going to escort you out so the white blood cell grabs it and oop that spear goes right through that white blood cell all the enzymes in the white blood cell leak out and they cause an intense inflammation of the joint capsule. And that joint and that problem that we get is something that we call gout. So if you know somebody with gout, 
It's a uric acid problem where the uric acid has caused the inflammation because the white cells are trying to attack the, the, the spears, which are the crystals, the uric acid crystals, and the uric acid crystals spear the white blood cells, destroy the white blood cells, and all the contents of the white blood cells get spread out and split and spread around in the, in the, in the, in the joint, which causes tremendous inflammation. I know I used to love to see patients with uh, gout, uh, treat them with some medication. Usually within 24 hours, they're like about 95% better. But when they're having gout, oh my gosh, if you've known someone with gout, they don't even like to have the sheets touching them. A lot of times with gout, what will happen is people will be perfectly fine. Usually in males. Males much more commonly. Females, unusual. Males a lot more commonly. What they'll do is they'll go to bed and they'll say, hey, I'm going to bed. Going to have a good night. See you in the morning. You know, going to go fishing in the morning or something like that. And what happens is they get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and they put their foot down the, on the floor and they could barely stand because their foot looks like it's about ready to explode. It's so red, hot, and swollen. It looks like an infection. You can actually feel the heat coming out of it because of this reaction with these with these white blood cells. And then they can't walk. So guess what? They don't go fishing the next day. Okay. Uh, and and that's what that's frequently what happens. It occurs at night. They wake up in the morning, tremendous pain. Okay. Urinary bladder, you know what that is. Urination, you better know what that is because you've been doing it for a long time. And the same thing with voiding, which is the same thing. Voiding, urination, micturition, all the same words okay so these are some vocabulary words that I think you should probably a couple of abbreviations and I'll probably point out the ones that I think that are most most important uh, there's a thing called ADH okay and ADH is a hormone and it's anti-diuretic now diuresis means to urinate so anti-diuresis would be what to limit the urine. So when people take a, if you know uh, somebody who's with high blood pressure and they're taking a diuretic, guess what? They're always in the bathroom. Okay, I'm going to give you a hint. They're always in the bathroom because they have to pass the urine. And the reason why they do that is they take a diuretic to eliminate a lot of the body water, a lot of the body fluid, which decreases their vascular volume, the fluid inside the vessels decrease the blood pressure. That's how they do it. But sometimes we need to conserve water, such as if we get dehydrated or something like that. And there's a little gland that's behind the eyes called the pituitary gland, about the size of the tip of my little finger, about the size of a pea. And what that pituitary gland does, a part of it, the back of it, puts out this hormone called antidiuretic hormone, which actually decreases my urine flow. Okay, decreases my urine output to conserve water. So ADH means antidiuretic hormone. Hormone A uh, ARF. ARF stands for acute renal failure. Um, yeah, you probably want to know that one. I would think. Billy. Guess what Billy stands for? Bilirubin. We talked about bilirubin in the GI part. Okay, bilirubin is that yellowish brown pigment. Pigment. So when people have jaundice, what happens is they got so much bilirubin in their blood, they try to filter it in the kidney, and it gets in the urine. So as a result, the urine, instead of being a clear to a mildly mild yellow, the the urine gets really dark. It gets down like a, a, a orangish brown or brownish. Okay, it gets very very dark. Okay. Now here's a tip. Sometimes our urine is a little bit darker than otherwise, but if I take it, the urine, and stick it in a cup and put a cup, put a top on it, and you shake it, it's going to cause foam. Normally, that foam that would be on top of the urine would be would be white, would be clear. On the other hand, if I have bilirubin in my in my urine and I shake the urine again with a top on it, don't spill it on yourself, but shake it with a top on, the foam will be yellow because the bilirubin will stain the foam as well. So bilirubin sometimes shows up in people with jaundice. BUN. BUN is important. BUN stands for blood urea nitrogen. We talked about how we want to prevent nitrogen from building up in the blood, uh, and it does that by the kidneys getting rid of it. What happens is one lab test that we commonly do is called a BUN, not a BUN. If you call it a BUN, or if you call it a BUN, they're going to point to the door and say, get out of here. It's called a BUN, and BUN stands for blood urea nitrogen. What happens is if my kidneys aren't working, what I'm going to see is my blood urea nitrogen levels go up and up and up. Why? If I can't get rid of the nitrogen because my kidneys aren't working, because the kidneys are eliminating the nitrogen, where's the nitrogen going to go? All dressed up? Where's it going to go? In the blood. So in the bloodstream, my nitrogen levels, whoop, my nitrogen levels go up and up and up. And that's one way I could test urine function, you know, kidney function by looking at what's called the, the, the blood urea nitrogen. So it's an important lab test. I wouldn't worry about that one. Uh, cath. Cath just means put a catheter in. That's a piece of cake. I wouldn't worry about that one either. Um, Chronic kidney disease, yeah, I probably wouldn't ask that one. Okay, uh, chloride, that's a, that's another electrolyte we talked about. Uh, CRF, uh, chronic renal, uh, you know, or chronic renal failure. You know, it's just the opposite of acute. If you don't know what acute and chronic means, acute means happening now. Okay, chronic means it's been going on for a long time. 
Okay, so the difference between acute and chronic is an acute problem is one that's happening right now. A chronic problem is one that's been going on for a long, long time. Okay, a couple more abbreviations. CNS. I think that that's one you should know. And it's not just for, for the kidney, but for a lot of things. It stands for culture and sensitivity. If I want to, if somebody has an infection and I want to see what's causing the infection, I'll get a sample of what I want to look at and I take a culture of it. I'll actually put it on a plate and grow it. So I'm able to see what the bacteria is that's causing the infection. And then what they also do is they put little antibiotic discs on that. And what happens if the antibiotic is good enough to kill it or destroy it or stop it from growing, you'll see a large area around that antibiotic disc where that bacteria will not grow on the culture plate. And that's what they know what antibiotic to use for a particular infection by the sensitivity. So they know what the bug is by the culture and they know what antibiotic to use by the sensitivity. Cysto just means a cystoscopy where they look inside the, the bladder with a the tube. They just take a tube, look inside, boop, there it is. You can see the inside, okay? Uh, I wouldn't worry about end-stage renal disease. I won't worry about that. Uh, that's bicarbonate, which is also another thing, which is a buffer. If I have, if something's too too acidic, bicarbonate freely, freely uh, usually makes it less less acidic, okay? Uh, hemodialysis, I wouldn't worry about that right now. I wouldn't worry about that, okay? Interstitial cystitis. Potassium, K, I would know that. That means potassium, means uh, K means potassium, which is another electrolyte, very important. Now, this one you got to know. This one you got to know. KUB, not a cub. We had it. We didn't have a bun. We don't have a cub. KUB stands for kidneys, ureters, bladder. What it is is an x-ray that they could take of the abdomen where you could see a shadow of the kidneys. You don't see the ureter unless there's like a stone in it, and you'll see a little bit of the bladder. I guarantee you what's going to happen is in a, in a, in a follow-up uh, video, PowerPoint video, I'll be showing you some about, um, a little bit about uh, what that KUB looks like. I have some x-rays of KUBs that will be there. Na, sodium, definitely know that. That's an important electrolyte, okay? PD, don't worry about peritoneal dialysis. We'll talk about, I'll show you what that is later on, but right now it makes much sense. Uh, pH, pH is, is the acidic or basic nature of, of, of something. And again, they look at the urine in regards to its pH. Uh, uh, phenyl kidney urine, or polycystic kidney disease. Yeah, uh, I've had, a, I'll show you a polycystic kidney. Hold on to that. Polycystic kidney, I'll show you a polycystic kidney in a little bit, okay? Uh, PKU, uh, phenylketonuria, which is a disease. Don't worry about that one. Uh, I wouldn't worry about uh, this one right there, percutaneous ultrasonic lith lithotripsy. Um, I would actually look at it um, uh, instead of percutaneous ultrasonic lithotripsy, I've looked, I've seen it um, uh, uh, abbreviated in um, an, another way. It's, X, it's E, C S W extra corporeal shockwave therapy. And what they do is they blast the kidneys um, with a high ultrasonic beam. And what it does is hope to break up the stones. I'll show you net, I'll show you it later on and you'll it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, a retrograde pyelogram. I'll show you a retrograde pyelogram. I'll show you a lithotripsy. I'll show you a retroplate pyelogram. I'll show you a polycystic kidney disease. They'll make sense a little bit later. Specific gravity. Specific gravity is how much stuff is actually suspended or diluted uh, or dissolved in urine. You know, things that are water have a specific gravity of very close to 1, 1.00. The more stuff that's floating around, not, not things you could see, but a more like uh, glucose and other types of things, that, that PA or that specific gravity will go up. So they could actually look and see how concentrated or how dilute the urine is by looking at the, at the specific gravity. The specific gravity that's closer to 1, very dilute. Specific gravity is as much higher than 1, it's more concentrated. UA, I would definitely know that. That's urinalysis. There's a number of different things. I'll show you that where you can actually take little little dipsticks and you could dip them into the urine and you could tell a lot of things like glucose, protein, all kinds, acetone, all kinds of different things in the urine just by dipping up, putting a little stick, a it's a little plastic stick with a little pieces of filter paper that are, that are uh, coated with a certain type of a re reagent. So when you stick the stick in there in the urine, it will cause a different color and you read the color off the side of a bottle and I'll show you what that's like. UTI, definitely know that one. Uh, that's urinary tract infection. That's a definite one. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I think I would know that one. Uh, I think I would know that one on this this thing, this one right here. Um, I wouldn't worry about the, the bottom one, voiding system urethrogram. I will show you one of these. I will show you this. 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 Okay, in a, in some in an, in an, in another video. Okay. So that pretty much. 
covers what I wanted to talk about on this one. What we've talked about so far is a little bit about the um, the organs, which are limited but still complex. Okay, we talked. Uh, we gave you the uh, uh, the combining forms, which you should go over. Okay, uh, uh, these are all in the book as well. Uh, go, the comp combining forms, the vocabulary, and we'll be talking using these vocabulary in, in upcoming. Uh, I have a, I have another video that's going to be coming up uh, later on uh, to follow this in regards to conditions and uh, other. Um, uh, findings, you know, you know, urinary tract findings that we'll that we'll have, and then we also did a little bit about about abbreviations. Okay, I think I pointed out the ones that were probably the most important. Hopefully, uh, make sure that you look at this one before you look at any subsequent uh, urinary tract uh, 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 presentations, because this will help you to understand those a little bit better. Okay, and I'll see you at the next one, and uh, be safe.